Anticipation, congratulations to Vidarbha for the wonderful conference, for the wonderful conference being organized. And uh, Dr. Arul Kumaran, I'm very happy to have the pleasure of chairing your session once again in the last fortnight. And on such a very important topic like labor care guide uh, by WHO. Uh, actually, it's a tool that is shifting from the partogram. All the days we had been doing partogram, so it looks more like a uh, book figure. So WHO Labor Care Guide is a tool that aims to support good quality, evidence-based, respectful care during labor and childbirth. Irrespective of the settings, that is, it could be a high-end or lower-end, but on the whole, holistic approach. It's a manual which is right based evidence for optimistic experience of labor and childbirth for the mother. So with this, we can't have any better person or best person than Dr. Arul Kumaran, who is with, uh, who is so experienced and he'll enlighten us. Dr. Sheshikala. Oh. Dr. Lakshmi. Dr. Lakshmi, Dr. Supriya here. Yeah, 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 Dr. Supriya. Uh, sir, yeah. aapka, uh, please show your intro slide and make it slideshow. Arul Kumaran, sir. Yeah, and make it slideshow, sir, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So a very good evening to all of you. And I'm here. Um, first of all, I thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this very important session. It is indeed a privilege to introduce a great academician, a teacher, and a great human being, Sir Sabrathanam Arul Kumaran, Sir, Professor. So, Professor Arul Kumaran, Sir, is Professor is Emeritus of Obstetrics and Gynecology, St. George University of London from 2013, after he retired from his post as Professor and Head of Department, uh, OBGYN. He is a Foundation Professor of OBGYN, St. George Medical School, University of Nicosia from 2014. And he's he also the visiting professor of Institute of Global Health Policy, Innovation, Imperial College, London. He was past president of the FIGO, the British Medical Association and the RCOG of the UK. Over to you, sir. I'm honored and over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh for the kind introduction. And I'm most grateful to Professor Pushpalada and Supriya for the kind introduction and allowing me to speak. First, I'd like to thank Lakshmi Shrishkandri for inviting me as president of the local uh, organization, as well as to the national chair, Professor Usha Sharma, and also my respect to the guest of honors, uh, Rishma Pai and uh, uh, the Milin Shah, Rangila Sinha, and the others. Uh, there are so many I can acknowledge, but I'll get on with my lecture. So the topic is migration from partogram to labor care guide. And I have no declaration of interest and the opinion presented us just some thoughts based on the current evidence. But I like to acknowledge Olufemi, Oladapo, Metin, Gulmaseglu, Mercedes from WHO, and Dame Teen Lavender from Liverpool for providing me with information to prepare this talk. So the objective of this talk will be, why should we move from paragram to labor care guide? Why migrate from the paragram which we are used for a long time? Understand the historical aspects of the labor curve and recent research on labor progress curves and suggestion for management in the future of labor with labor care guide and conclusions based on the evidence available. One of the main concerns is about the rising cesarean section rates. As you can see from 1990 to 2014, it is rising in all the regions, as you could see, Oceania, North America, and so on. There is a difference between the urban and the countryside because urban side, if it is city of uh, Delhi or Mumbai or Chennai, it will be higher compared to a little bit rural area. Globally, you can map out the cesarean section rate. India doesn't come under the high as more than 30%, but 
but it comes in the region of 15 to 20 percent. That's because it is taken as countrywide distribution. But if you take, as I mentioned, city-wise, then it will be high, neutralized by the low section rates in the smaller cities. And if you take, according to the uh, Organization for Economic Development Co Corporation average, it's about 27 percent. And if you look at the countries where there is more private care, there is more fear of litigation and less counseling for benefits of uh, cesarean section or not, then Turkey, Mexico, Chile, Korea, Hungary has a high section rate compared to the Nordic countries where they have more nationalized health services and well-organized care services. The section rates are between 15 to 20 percent. So you can Imagine that the women there are not different from the women in Turkey or Mexico, but still the rates are about three to four times higher because it is not a national health service. And so private practice has a major influence on cesarean section rate. Now, the WHO was concerned about this rising cesarean section rate. So they did large population-based studies to correlate okay. the maternal and perinatal mortality Can I call cesarean section rate. And as you can see here, the horizontal axis shows the cesarean section rate. As you could see, after 10%, whether they are least developed or whether you, even if you correct for human developmental index, after 10%, there is no improvement in maternal mortality when we take maternal mortality per 100,000 or neonatal mortality as per 1,000. So in other words, after 10%, there is no major reduction in maternal or neonatal mortality. But there are limitations with the WHO study because correlation does not mean causation. And current data does not examine the outcome of the neonate or the mother if the section rate is more than 30%. And also it doesn't take into account perinatal morbidity, pediatric outcome, psychological and social well-being of the mother and so forth. So we can't take that particular analysis alone. So the WHO revised its guidance in 2015 and they said we don't want to promote any specific rate of cesarean section at a population level but we should provide cesarean section to all women who need it and they proposed that every center, every country should analyze the section based on Robson's classification. Now the Robson classification put forward by Michael Robson from Ireland does not take into as an indication for C-section. They talk only of five things, parity, onset of labor, gestational age, fetal presentation, and number of fetuses. Group one and two, as you could see, deals with nulliparous women. Group one, those who are over 37 and in spontaneous labor because they have high section rate. Group two has high section rate, either because they do nulliparous after elective section or induction of labor, which failed. And three and four are similar to nulliparous, but multiparous groups. And group five is those that are previous sections. So in any country, group one, two, and five, the maximum cesarean section is contributed by one, two, and five. The number six, which is breach, contributes a small percentage, and seven, multiple pregnancy, uh, or eight, multiple pregnancy, a small percentage. So the key messages after they analyzed based on the Robson's classification was cesarean section are effective in saving maternal and infant lives, but only when they are required for medically indicated reasons. Second, it can cause significant complications, disability and death, particularly in settings that lack facilities to conduct safe surgery and treat complication. Third, cesarean section should be done only when medically necessary. So the African countries got together and wanted to find out whether WHO statement is true. So they did what is known as an ASOS study, African Surgical Outcome Study, by taking a snapshot of all the cesarean section done on a seven day as a, a ob observational study, which was published in the Lancet. And it showed that cesarean section in Africa has uh, 50 times higher mortality for mothers. We have to understand that ASO study done in 
247 hospitals in 22 countries uh, involved 3,792 mothers and maternal mortality was 5.4 per thousand operation, which is compared to 0.1 per thousand in the UK, which is 50 times higher than high income countries. But we have to remember that in Africa, there is also pre-delivery complications like preeclampsia. They might have come for bleeding and abruption and there have been anesthetic complications as well. So there might be other compounding factors, but nevertheless, it's a, a, not an easy figure not to forget that 50 times higher maternal mortality. So we had to use it sparingly. And in developed countries, the placental accreta spectrum disorders is causing more mortality and morbidity because of cesarean section. So our motto as doctors should be unnecessary C-section cause unjustifiable health risk and primum non nocere. So don't do any harm and do good. So this was analyzed in detail by this study about how to prevent first cesarean delivery, what were the indications rather than the Robson's classification. And as you could see, the most cesarean sections are done because of labor dystocia in the first stage. And in the second stage, people are not doing forceps of vacuum deliveries, but they are resorting to cesarean section. And malpresentation also gives rise to a small percentage. But also if you look at in labor, that's a major component, failed induction contributes a lot, as well as non-reassuring fetal heart rate. So in other words, if we can manage the labor better, then we can reduce the cesarean section by 50 to 80%. So the problem lies in how we manage labor in most of the countries. And if you go back to Robson's classification, those who had to, we had to focus our attention on nulliparous women who come in spontaneous labor after 37 weeks, those who get induced or who we are putting for elective section, as well as whether we should give trial of labor in those who had a previous cesarean scar. That's group one, two, and five are the most areas we had to study to reduce cesarean section. So we go back to the labor management. We said we had to better manage labor. So all the things started with Emmanuel Friedman in 1954. He introduced the graphic description of labor. But these were not normal women. Although we everybody says 100 normal women, but 68 had forceps, one had section, one frank, one multiple pregnancy, 15 had labor augmentation, and there was one early neonatal death. So any, any point of description, it is not normal labor, what he described. The second thing which happened was his paper was misunderstood because everybody thinks the minimum labor progress is 1.1, but it is maximum slope is 1.1 centimeter per hour. So it's important that we have to remember the paper did not say slow labor, but maximum labor is 1.1. Then the next issue is to see about the construction of the alert and action line by Philpott from Zimbabwe. So he decided there should be a graph which can differentiate those who are going to go slowly and run into problem and cause vesicovaginal fistula because of long labor. So he constructed the alert line at one centimeter per hour. That is the maximum dilatation speed, but he thought it was the minimum dilatation speed. And he also mentioned in African priming gravid, the pattern described by Freeman could not be applied because the African women dilated much slower. Uh, so he, although he understood that the labor was progressing slowly, but he stuck to one centimeter because there were no prospective studies. And uh, it must, his whole aim was to separate the majority of normal patients from abnormal patients and to avoid morbidity because he was concerned about morbidity to the baby as well as the mother. So he stuck to one centimeter. Although the slowest uh, Zimbabwean women of 10% dilated much faster than that. Kirian O'Driscoll from Ireland took the same cue or the same paper from Friedman. And he decided if they deviate right of one centimeter per hour, then they should be augmented. So as a result, 550 patients, so 55% of their patients got oxytocin. 
but they have one-to-one -one care. They have oxytocin infusion drips. They have proper fetal monitoring. So they manage to get better results, although they put oxytocin on a large number of women. Now, WHO was dragged in because despite the use of paragraph, the cesarean section rates were going up and up. So in 1987, they formed a technical group and they wanted a trial to be done having a paragraph similar to the one in Zimbabwe. And the trial was done in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And it had the alert line. If it is labor was to the left of the alert line, no action. Right of the alert line, they put an action line four hours to the right, and they decided to open. Uh, this study was uh, written, or the protocol was written by myself, Barbara Cost, who was a midwife who worked with uh, uh, Phil Pott in Zimbabwe, who then later worked in the WHO, and Christopher Lennox, who is from Papua Nini, New Guinea. So we adapted Phil Pott's paragraph, but had the Friedman curves as the baseline. That is how it is. And we decided to fix the latent phase for eight hours, then the alert line for one centimeter per hour, and the action line four hours to the right. So this was popularized. So in addition, we had descent of the fetal head, fetal heart rate, oxytocin, and so on added together. So the model was applied in Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, and we studied nearly uh, 25,000 women. And uh, the principle was that we decided active phase starts at three centimeters. We should give eight hours in the latent phase. We should take one centimeter per hour as the standard labor progress curve, and we should give four hours to the right. And this is one of the hospital picture, Budikamulia. This is WHO appointed as consultant. So I worked in Indonesia in two hospitals for months, three months at a time in two hospitals. And similarly, uh, Ken Stewart and others worked in other hospitals in Thailand and Malaysia. So this was the result of the study, the impact of partograph or oncom. It was followed, this is from the WHO study published in the Lancet. That showed very clearly that labors lasting more than 18 hours was reduced by using a partograph from 6.4 to 3.4. Number of labor augmentation reduced if you have a proper curve from 20 to 9.1. Emergency section rate reduced and stillbirth rate also reduced. So after this study of 35,000 women across eight sites in these three countries, it was decided that all the countries should do WHO paragraph. However, Zhang in 2002 decided to compare Friedman's curve with what he retrospectively observed in 1,329 nulliparous women. And he showed that the active phase doesn't start at three centimeters, it starts somewhere at five centimeters. So this is Zhang's paragraph. After five centimeters is one centimeter per hour. Up to five centimeters, it was slow. So he challenged the view that we are starting labor early or acting early, and therefore uh, we are augmenting many. Now he followed up by another study in 2010 with 62,000 dividing nulliparous women from multiparous, those who had delivered one baby versus two babies. And if you watch very carefully, up to five centimeters, the labor is very slow. So this really stimulated people to look at it very carefully. And if you numerically translated graph, that same graph, if you numerically translate, it takes about 0.8 hours for the cervix to dilate from five to six centimeters. But if it is four to five, it takes 1.3 hours and the 95th centile is six hours. So in other words, the 95th centile is a long time up to five centimeters, but once you come to five centimeters, then it is less than one centimeter of progress. That's the median, not the slowest or the uh, fastest, but the median and the 95th centile is 3.2. So today, if you had to construct a partogram, we will say the active phase should start at five centimeters and then one centimeter per hour and the action line should be at least three at three and a half hours to the right of that line based on the numerical values we see. The American College took all this evidence and they suggested 
that the prolonged latent phase should not be called unless they give at least 20 hours in nulliparous and 14 in multiparous. And they also said that cervical dilatation of six centimeters should be considered as the active phase of labor. So individual countries started doing their own and we looked and they also said they should be given uh, at least four to six hours of augmentation if they are not progressing. And I can recollect one of the studies which we did in 1987 in Singapore when I was working there and we saw the same thing. If you take one centimeter per hour and then take two hours right to the right as action line, we stimulated augmented 17% nulliparous and 8% multiparous. So in other words, if we shift the active phase of labor to three to five centimeter, we'll be giving oxytocin to less women with similar outcome. So WHO decided they must study this prospectively rather than retrospective analysis. So they started what they called as a bold study, better outcomes in labor difficulty. It had four components. One was the research component, primary research. What they decided to do was 10,000 women in Nigeria and Uganda, they did not want to intervene. They just plotted the cervix. Even though they are slow, they did not give oxytocin or rupture the membranes. They let them carry on. So that was the primary research. The second they did was to do systemic reviews, systematic reviews, take all the studies available in the literature and see what they say. In addition to cervical dilatation, they also wanted to find out what the woman wants, what her needs, expectations, et cetera. Then they wanted to find the knowledge gap. What are we using? Can we revise the photograph? And can we use some self-implementable tools? And then finally, they wanted to do all the synthesis of what is available and make it into an implementation, which they call Passport to Safer Birth. So the WHO Bold project is, was being published as a protocol and it was to identify the essential elements, including threshold and interaction for intrapartum monitoring, which will trigger decision-making and interventions. So I'll just go through some of the um, studies which they are done. So in the prospective study, as you could see the black lines appearing in nulliparous women in Uganda and Nigeria, this was the type of curve they got. The yellow line represents how they dilated. And as you could see, the steep line starts appearing only at five centimeters. Uh, only at five centimeters, there's a steep line. And so if you want to draw a line, instead of starting at four, we should start the line at five. Now, if you really take the, after the first baby, the second baby and the third baby or more are the blue and the red lines. There again, if you look at the, um, dilatation, it is very acutely turning up at five centimeter. But I just want you to remember that there are so many women in both groups, nulliparous and multiparous, who are going to 18, 20 hours in labor. So in other words, they take a longer time than we expect, but end up in a good normal outcome. So we are probably pushing everybody into a certain parameter and making more, more cesarean section. So let us look at these curves on the existing WHO paragraph. So WHO paragraph has this alert and action line. So these are women with good outcome, both for the mother and the baby. So the cervix is dilating in vast number of women to the left of the alert line, another group of women to the left of the action line. But there are a number of women who are outside to the right of the action line, as you could see, and they are progressing, but they didn't have cesarean section, they delivered normally and also they had good neonatal as well as maternal outcomes. So in other words, the old axiom that we shouldn't allow the sun to set twice on a neighboring woman has to be a little bit questioned, but many of them delivered within the first 24 hours. So these are with good outcome. The next slide will show you those who had poor outcome, those are the red lines. So even those who delivered to the left of the alert line or left of the action line, Many of them had poor outcomes. So it is nothing to do with the progress of labor, but it is to do with the subject you discussed earlier on, like IUGR or preterm baby or infection. So many other things complicates labor, which can give rise to poor outcomes. So we can't take only cervical dilatation as a predictor of poor or good outcome in the mother and the baby. 
So there were papers written saying cervical dilatation over time is a poor prognosticator of severe adverse birth outcomes. And uh, this was published by the WHO. And the conclusion said our findings suggest that the labor progress is a variable phenomenon and the assessment over time is a poor predictor of severe adverse outcomes. So they had to rethink about giving more time for women to dilate rather than trying to push them uh, to deliver within a short time. So this is a numerical way of looking at nulliparous cervical dilatation. If you watch very carefully, two to three centimeters to dilate, it takes nearly nine hours, eight to nine hours. This is the composite of all these studies. I said there was a systematic analysis. Now three to four centimeters, it took two to three hours. Four to five centimeters, a little bit more than an hour. Five to six comes to one. After five, to six, then it, they dilate at one centimeter. So this is the median time, overall median time. So you can apply the one centimeter per hour after five or six centimeters. But also I want you to observe the possibility of giving a, a standard deviation. How long can we give a standard deviation? That is given by the horizontal lines. As you could see here, the after six to seven centimeters, it narrows down compared to if it is here, it takes nearly three to four hours for three to four centimeters to dilate. So in other words, the later the dilatation, they need shorter time for them to come up to full dilatation. Now we look at multiparous women, the same applies, although three to four centimeters is a little bit uh, slower. Once they come to four to five centimeters on five centimeters, then they are dilating at one centimeter per hour. So in other words, action line or the active phase of labor has to be considered in the future to be at five centimeters. Now I mentioned about the qualitative studies done by the WHO. So what are the qualitative study outcome? Well, the, what the women wanted was a healthy mother and baby at the end. Of course, everybody wants a healthy mother and baby a desire to be in control as to how they want to walk, how they want to lie down, what they want to drink and eat, support from a birth companion so that they can apply, um, act as an advocate for them to go and speak to the nurse or the doctor when they want it, and um, sensitive, caring, and kind and respectful. So all this could be condensed into uh, five different areas. Respectful care, that is what is being pushed. And I know in India, you are starting the Manyata program uh, and similar programs, which will help in improving respectful care. Good communication. Women want the providers to take time and communicate. Labor companion, because labor companion is not to stand by, but to give them fluids, to drink, something to eat, rub their back, reassure them, call for the nurse or midwife. And when the labor companion is there, the doctor or nurse does not speak to the woman rudely. So this is quite important. Labor companion is an advocate, helper, and so on. Essential physical resources, whatever they want. Like if you are giving oxytocin, you should try and use a infusion pump rather than a gravity fed drip. And also not only that, but the environment should be clean, not dirty. And they should be able to listen to what the woman wants and the companion advocates. And if you look at the Cochrane uh, 2008 uh, review, this is quite important for us to understand. They looked at the paragraphs, which paragraph to use. So I would like to read this and say, Cochrane Review explored the use of paragraph for labor. It had two objectives. The first was to assess whether the paragraph use improved the outcome. Second was which paragraph design was preferable. They reviewed 11 studies, three compared paragraph with no paragraph, and in the three studies comparing paragraph with no paragraph, no evidence to suggest standard use of paragraph was favorable to no paragraph. In other words, even without paragraph, if you could give good care, then the outcome was the same. And the eight other studies explored different paragraph designs and failed to provide evidence that one was better than the other. The only convincing study showed that if you drop the latent phase of labor, part in the paragraph, then it gave better outcome. So, because you don't augment labor very early because you are fixing a latent phase. 
So the WHO decided to drop the use of latent phase in their subsequent paragraphs. And uh, the study demonstrated that cesarean section and oxytocin augmentation were higher when paragraph which included latent phase. So the WHO dropped it. So this is the paper from Tina Lavender. So in other words, Cochrane says, if you don't use paragraph, that is as good as using a paragraph provided you give better care and different designs of paragraph did not improve the outcome. Now, what about this study by Zhang et al? Zhang decided to join a Norwegian group and do a randomized control study comparing the WHO paragraph with Zhang's guidelines and they didn't find anything. So we did not find any significant difference in the frequency of interpartum cesarean section using between obstetric units adhering to WHO paragraph or Zhang's guidelines. So in other words, although Zhang had started five centimeters and then plot, you'll get a better outcome. It did not show an outcome. So in other words, paragraph alone does not improve the outcome, whether you use Zhang or WHO or any other paragraph. So this is the latest recommendation by the WHO in 2018 following the study. So what is the definition of the latent and active phase? So they said latent phase is characterized by painful uterine contraction with variable changes in the cervix and dilatation should be up to five centimeters. And the active first stage characterized by regular painful contraction from five centimeter to full dilatation. So that is fixed for us to understand. That is how we are going to look at it. Before five centimeter, give them 16 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours, but reassure them, give nutrition, give fluid and so on. So duration of the first stage, once they have become five centimeters, they said it does not extend beyond 12 hours in first labor. So if it is today, if you are using the standard WHO paragraph, then we will try to give five hours and four hours to the right, nine hours. But here they say, give 12 hours after five centimeters. And in multiple respiration, then you can give up to 10 hours in the subsequent labor. That means after the first baby. So that is the current recommendation to give more time. So based on that, that they have other recommendations what not to do, um, not to expect one centimeter per hour dilatation or minimum dilatation of one centimeter and labor may not act naturally accelerate until it's five centimeters and so on. So what they have done is to introduce whatever they have synthesized as evidence into the labor care guide. So I'll move straight into labor care guide. This is the labor care guide. And I just want you to pay one attention here. What they have put as alert parameters. You can see in the blue, what is called alert parameters. So here we have supportive care. We have parameters about the baby, about the progress of labor, about the mother and so on. And if it exceeds certain things, it is called alert. So I'm going to cut this into a sections. Section one and two is very simple. Identifies the mother and admission. So name of the mother, parity, labor onset. The second is actually supportive care. So about the companion, whether the companion is there, whether there is pain relief, whether there is oral there fluid, is turn, there's posture. So if it is N means in the alert parameter, it is no, yes means it is yes. So every half an hour they are plotted. Section three and four is about care of the baby and care of the mother. Care of the baby includes fetal heart rate monitoring, amniotic fluid and fetal position, caput and molding. And four is about woman, the blood pressure, pulse, everything. And as you could see, they also wanted to find out whether there are late decelerations. That is the alert parameter. As you could see L here in the second column is L. So nowadays there are monitors which are available, which not only gives the rate, but also graphical display. So you can really uh, look at the decelerations and in the labor care guide, you can mar mark it as late. If it is L, that's the alert. So you say L, if it is variable, you say V. If it is early, you say A. If it is no deceleration, you will say N. So they want you to be a little bit more precise in monitoring and that can be done with modified Dopplers, which will give you the graph. Section five is about progress of labor, about contractions every 10 minutes, duration of contraction, how long it will last, and also labor progress, 
This is about starting at five centimeters. So they are giving six hours at five centimeters for them to dilate to six. If they are six centimeters to dilate to seven, five hours. If it is seven to dilate to eight, three hours and so on. So as the labor progresses, they give more and more time. And the descent of the head, there is no alert parameters. And then finally, the section six is about medication, seven is shared decision-making and eight is birth outcome. And the alert parameters I mentioned very carefully is given at the right at the bottom here, what to write in these columns. If it is unknown U, if it is supine position, SP, mobile MO and so on and so forth. And finally, the birth outcome, mode of birth, blood loss, neonatal state, Abgar scores and birth weight. So it's very composite telling the whole story about the labor and the outcome. And I would finalize, finally sum it up. This is an article written in the best practice by Tina Lavender who did the Cochrane database. So she says, as the evidence for existing paragraphs is inconclusive in terms of clinical uh, outcome, they should adhere to national or local policies to guide paragraph use. Health facilities should audit paragraphs to identify any barriers to use and to find the most effective plans to overcome them. So it, she advocates to use a paragraph, but to be selective and to use it very carefully and to audit them. And labor monitoring tools should be used following introduction of an implementation strategy. So what can I say in terms of the group who are listening very patiently? I think the first thing we, are, we can all do is to intervene only out to five to six centimeters and in the latent phase, give as much of time as possible. And whether five to 10 centimeters, whether to give 10 to 12 hours or not, based on local consideration. For example, if you are busy labor ward, you can't keep women uh, in labor for a long time, then you might have to intervene early. Use labor car guide on a research basis. So advocate as an organization, use maybe you can do a trial of using a WHO standard paragraph with the labor car guide and see whether it'll be more beneficial. Finally, respectful care and also labor companion to act as an advocate. And that'll be the final message. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. It was a wonderful session. A uh, lot of in information on this keynote. Raj, Raj, let the chairperson give concluding remarks. Yeah, chairperson would like to just quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please give your concluding remarks on sir's talk. Dr. Steshikala here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Dr. Professor Arul Kumaran, for a wonderful talk on the labor care guidelines. Yes, as you have mentioned, we, we are always on the lookout for improvement on our care giving to our laboring mothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we are still on the lookout for the ideal situation. I From the time of Friedman, Driscoll, Philpott, all these modifications and your alert and action lines, all these have added to our uh, armamentarium, but we just okay. know that uh, yeah, we have not got the ideal solution. But yes, as you mentioned so beautifully and in this bold WHO bold study, now we have all realized that only from five centimeters and beyond only the labor uh, progresses quickly. And it is only between that three and five centimeters, you are, you know, jittery whether to wait or augment or what to do. So quite often we keep sending the patients back when they come to us with one to two centimeters and their contractions are not up to the mark. Send them home and then ask them to come back and they come around five centimeters and in a short time they deliver. So I think these are also certain things which we can adopt in and as you mentioned, different cities, different setups, we have to have our own um, method of monitoring and um, monitoring these women in labor. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Arul Kumaran for a lovely enlightening talk. I hope all the audience have gained a lot of insight from, all, uh, from the um, uh, uh, you, from what you have mentioned, different studies and what Professor Zhang and others have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause.